and welcome to Cataclysm Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.cataclysm.com. My name is Jason J. Rock Houston, and we're speaking with um, Christina um, Avila from uh, CA Promotions. Welcome, welcome to the show today, Christina. How you doing? Thank you so much. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Happy Saturday. Happy Saturday. And um, as I was telling you right before we start the interview right now, um, as we were talking on the phone, um, I've never really um, um, interviewed a published before, so it's a little different, but I'm for that reason alone, I'm looking very forward to it. Um, I should let people know that um, recently I posted an interview with um, Greg Fox, the, the keyboardist and founding member of um, the Renaissance Rock Orchestra, and you're actually Greg's publicist, and after we posted his interview, you kind of reached out to me and said you'd like to um, do an interview yourself and talk about, I guess, so the best place to start this interview off, if you don't mind, um, you want to talk a little bit about um, how you got involved with... Um, Greg Fox and the Renaissance Rock Orchestra as far as um, working with them as a band? <clears throat> sure. Um, well, this goes all the way back as far as my beginning times of promoting. As far as promoting and music, um, my dad was Cuban. My mom's family was from the Middle East. Okay. And I have three older sisters. And music was something that I grew up with as a kid with my family. Mm -hmm. American Bandstand, oh, wow. Gold, Soul Train, all those awesome shows. I kind of lived through all that myself, so we're, we're, I can relate that way. <laughs> yes, and I lost my dad um, 11 years ago. Oh, wow. And um, he was just really sick, wow. but God bless him. Um, after he passed away, my best friend, my uh, fiancé, and my daughter... So to me, why don't you start up a music page? And I basically didn't know what to say, but I tried it. And long okay. story short, I worked with some really cool people. I got to know the ins and outs. But of course, like everything else in this mm. world and life, yeah. they're roller coasters. Cool. And yeah. I've never been to L.A. I always wanted to work in the L.A. scene. And I learned a lot of what to do, what not to do. And... Um, I just lost my mom last year. Oh, wow. Not because of COVID, but she was really sick also. But music was just something that we always had on A connection to, wow. And so um, I took seven months off promoting, watching the Hallmark Channel movies with her. Oh, wow. Just because yeah. I wanted to spend time with her. And I'm glad I did. That's kind of the only blessing um, in all that is that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's awful anytime uh, people, you know, you know, pass, but... But if you're in a situation where, you know, if a person's been ill for a while and you know it's coming, at least you have that time, like you said, to kind of know, okay, it's coming. I want to spend as much time as I can with it. Right, right. Yeah. I, um, there were some really good concerts that were coming here to Connecticut. I'm yeah. about an hour and a half oh, wow. from New York City. I'm southwestern Connecticut. Wow. And I just didn't want to do anything. My mom would always say, go out, go out. I'm like, no, mom. Just want to be on with you. Plus, I'm a yeah. daycare teacher's assistant, so I work with two-year-olds and under. Wow! Yeah. Um, fifteen years, and I'm a single mom. Um, she's 27, but she's the love of my life. Wow. Um, so basically, I started this with I grew up, you know, in church, wow. um, with gospel music, but there was always all kinds of music: Syrian music, Cuban mm. music. My father taught me how to dance Spanish. Yeah. My mom taught me taught me how to dance Arabic music. Um, so yeah, church, family, that's where everything started for me. Oh, interesting. Um, I started with two bands from London. Okay. One was called Delts and Pleasures, and they sent me some demos when I yeah, checked yeah, out, listened yeah. to the music, they broke up. Wow. And then there was another band from London called Heaven's Basement, and they were coming to the United States, and I was really excited, but then, unfortunately, they broke up. Yeah. Then I was working with some local bands here, and that's where it started wrong because I was trying to fit in. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to be something that I wasn't. Okay. So I stopped for a while. Then I went to a holiday show in New Jersey about six years ago, maybe more. Okay. To see this band called Rock Candy. They're from New Jersey. Oh. Premier ultimate tribute band, cover band. Ian Cress is a front man. He is amazing. The band, Rocky and is amazing. He um, had mentioned to me about Rick Fox. Yeah. Rick Fox grew up with in New York, and they had a band together. I believe it was called Sin in the 70s, 80s. Oh, wow. You and know, he told um, me uh, to reach me. out to Rick wow, because wow. Rick was a good mentor. Yeah, yeah. So I did. And I've been doing stuff for Rick on and off. 
Um, he's a great guy, great mentor, um, really helped me, and he still does, even though he's not doing much with music. Yeah. He's a good, he's He's one of those. He's, he's one of those guys. I think is a great source to have a great connection because while he's not busy doing too much musically these days, um, he he was a big part of both the L.A. and the New York um, scene back yeah. in the days. And he's one of those guys that you know he never really kind of um, had his big break that he deserved, but he came so close. I mean, if you look what he did with even just uh, the band Steeler and, and then his band Sin, right. and it's kind of interesting we're talking about Rick Fox because um, I'm sure I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but um, I've interviewed him a number of times over the years, and me and him are currently working on this thing that um, that we're going to call the Rick Fox story because he's got so many different parts of his story um, that I think people really aren't even aware of. We're going to try to, uh, it may take more, like um, we're, we're already going to record part two, and it's probably going to be a part three and part four because I don't think we can get everything down in like an hour's you know, time, and we really want to focus in on kind of his his story. I mean, a lot of people know ex-Wasp player, ex-Steeler, but I, I tell you, like... Um, I interviewed him last time about um, Steve, the band Steeler and his involvement with that. And, um, I, you know, that's one of those legendary kind of albums that everybody's always talking about. I don't know how it is. I never took the time to listen to the album, but I thought, okay, I'm going to be talking to Rick about this, so I better check out this album. And I thought, you know, all these years later, that album really kind of stands out. That's a classic, one of those things that kind of um, more people should really know about, you know? Right. I found out from him... That he's the original bass player for Wasp. Yeah, yeah. He was in Black League Wallace's home. And originally he was from, I believe, Amityville, New York. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in New York. And he moved to L.A. in the 80s, like everybody else, wanted to catch a break. And he was in Black League Wallace's home. I guess they were working on some things and mm -hmm. they were trying to get a name for the band. Sure enough, there was a Wasp. Yeah, yeah. Crawling around. And he named the band Ross, a Wasp. And he's the original bass player for Wasp. And they tried to, like, erase his, like, Blackie Lawless has totally yes. tried to erase his existence. Yes. Um, and luckily, Rick kept hold of, you know, some proof. Like, um, there's, as I'm sure you know, there's a photo Rick Fox has that's been, that he's been floating around um, online for several years now. And, and it's, it just amazes me. That's one of the reasons that really first wanted me to even talk to Rick the first time I reached out to him to interview him. Because I thought, wow, you know, just if you go, if you just go and read the guy's Wikipedia, I mean... He's got one of those stories that you'd be really amazed, like, how did this guy not um, go further? But but then, you know, talking about the band Sandwich, I'm going to be um, doing an interview with him about next week. That's the part of the story we're on next. Um, I'm sure he's told you the story about how Dana Strum kind of stole his song, and, and they, they called it Let Freedom Rock. I didn't know about this. Yeah. Maybe he did, and I forgot. Well, it, it's oh it's when you know, when, uh, it was when Dana Strum was when in the uh, Vinnie Vincent invasion, and. Um, right. And Dana at the time was kind of Vinny's right hand man. And on the, if you look on the second um, Vinny Vincent album, um, there's a song called "Let Freedom Rock." Um, it was originally titled something else. You, you, you could probably ask Rick because that's a story he shares with me several times, and it's, and, and it's um, amazing. Dana was kind of um, at the time Robert Fleischman had just been kind of let go from a Vinny Vincent band, and, and Dana Strum was, you know, was trying to get his boy Mark Slaughter in there, and they eventually did. And and Rick. Uh, Years later, found like a demo with um, Mark singing this, you know, his song, and and Dana Strum said he was um, kind of pushing his muscle around at the time, but he had and telling Rick, well, hey man, you know, you you, know, you just try to sue me, you, you watch what happens, you know, and um, so so he's never able to kind of do, it. but but that's a story you definitely, Christina, want to talk to Rick about because, <laughs> I mean, again, and then I don't know if you know too, but the recent um, Kiss documentary that's on A and E, um, some of those photos. Um, that we're using the documentary were some of Rick's um, early Kiss photos. <clears throat> yes, I was just going to mention that. He had mentioned to me that's yeah. what he did in New York. He went to the Kiss shows. There was a photographer, and he took lots of pictures, and I thought, wow, and this his, is an inter interesting person. Yeah, and his he connection said, to Kiss, too, is um, how he got connected with those guys early on. And, and he knew them, like, way back for just from being um, part of a New York music scene. And um, I guess he'd Peter, uh, he dated Peter Chris's sister or something at the time. And that was his introduction to the band. Wow. Okay. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there, there's a connection that you and I had, another connection. But um, yeah, Rick Fox, he's he's a super cool guy. And, and, and it's yeah. kind of interesting because you have guys like Blackie Lawless trying to just erase what he did. And then Blackie Lawless, as I'm sure he's told you, he's had kind of yes men trying to help Blackie just kind of do whatever he can to try to um, 
make people think that, oh no, Rick Fox was never in, in Wasp or anything, but, but he's got the photo to prove it, you know? To prove it, yeah. yeah and, and well, he, he's done, unfortunately, a lot of people wrong. He's hurt a lot of people. And he started uh, posting some of his demos from that he did with Wasp online, and um, and nothing's really become of that legally because I guess there's no way to prove. I mean, no way for Blackie to say you know those those tapes have been doctored or anything. Obviously, you, I mean, even if they were trying to say the photos were doctored, you can tell when stuff's photoshopped and when it's not. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but wow. but it's it's but you know, Christina. Um, so let let me ask: when you first started like doing your pr promotion of these bands. Uh, like you said, you started off online. I, I'm um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm kind of I'm also bet a lot a lot of your stuff you start out was on MySpace. <laughs> no, I didn't do my, MySpace. Okay. Um, I started off with my music page, which turned into my personal page. Okay. Um, I'm not. I have so many bands that I work with. They correct me if I get them in the wrong order. Um, <laughs> There was a musician from Oneida, New York. Okay. Took me under his wing. His name is Roy Costin. I'm definitely going to get you an interview for him. Okay, sure. His love band is called Love Bone. And about two months ago, my fiance and I went to his show, and he is um, a teacher for his local YMCA. Oh, wow. Teaches students. And he had a show called Guitar Day. And the lead singer, who was a special guest, was Ronnie Monroe from Metal Church. Oh, wow, wow. And Siberian. And I got to meet Ronnie Monroe also for the first time and got to meet this buddy of mine named Roy. His band, his whole life story too, I don't know if he has a Wikipedia page, but he has a website. Mm -hmm. He's another incredible musician, humble, family-oriented, very kind, just like Rick. Yeah. Um, a Canadian bass player from Toronto. His name is Ronnie Robson. Wow. I think Roy and Rick, they probably all have connections. Maybe they all know each other or they yeah. probably know people that know people. Yeah. Um, Ronnie is another one. Um, then there's a um, band from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh -huh. uh, heavy, really heavy influence okay. band called yeah. Hammer Down Heart. And it's Lonnie Hammer, who used to be the drummer for Jack Russell's Great White. Oh, and wow. he was also in Everyone's Mother's Nightmare. Nightmare. Okay, that's a band I'm aware of. Wow. You know, and let me tell you, Christina, um, excuse me for interrupting you, but um, you mentioned the band Love Bone, and this is kind of um, ironic, just in prepping for an interview we're doing now. Um, I, I was going on your page earlier this morning, and I happened to, I was looking at a list of bands, and that's the one band that I kind of clicked on their Facebook page that I see, saw that you work with Love Bone. I thought, wow, um, these, these guys They're are good. These guys They're are good pretty guys. good. They're yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, definitely going to get Roy on to be an interview with you. He's a lot of fun. And, you know, um, I, w I want to ask you, have you ever had any experience with, like, um, you know, uh, promoting of your band, of the different bands you work with in that um, Facebook kind of getting in the way? Um, I'm I, I kind of starting to in, um, encounter things like, where I'm noticing Facebook, for example, um, when they see that you have a page that's starting to kind of get popular, they try to, um, I guess because obviously they want to monetize everything, and so, yes. like, I, 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 it's, it's funny that I, I start getting messages, like, um, not even directly about my page, but, um, like, and sometimes I get this message, sometimes I have this issue, sometimes I don't, but, like, I was trying to like this band's page today, and it tells me, oh, um, you already subscribed to over 5,000 pages, um, get rid of the pages you, um, one of the pages that you already subscribed to if you want to like this page, and, and, um, somebody, was, another friend of mine was telling me, um, because I, I promote the hell out of my interviews and stuff, and, and it's funny, some, some get, like, a great response, and some hardly get any, and, and for example, like, um, I, I did an interview with Carmine a piece. it got about, and it's, it's a good, pretty good interview, it, it, uh, it got about 20 hits, and I got another interview from a band that nobody's ever heard of, and it got, like, uh, 50k hits, and um, somebody was telling me, Facebook likes to mess with people, like, well, okay, um, they mess with your algorithms or something in the sense that, like, um, when you're trying to get people to join a page, for example, they only want you to kind of friend 10 people a day. Otherwise, they try to control what people see in that. <laughs> yes. No, it's true. I mean, even like Renaissance Rock Orchestra, yeah. I'm trying really hard to build a following for their Spotify link. Yeah. I talked to Greg, and um, we're going to work on something together. But their Spotify link went up to like 1,000, and now it's like 104. Yeah, that's, so I'll that's, send you his Spotify yeah, link yeah. because... 
he's trying really hard, and I'm trying really oh, hard yeah. to get their numbers up, like Love Bone, like Hammer Down Hard. Yeah, yeah. This virtuoso guitarist and Russ Hewitt from Texas, too. Wow. It's like, one minute they're doing so great, and then I look at their numbers, and I think, what the heck? Yeah. I'm putting all this stuff out there. I'm trying to put it in my groups, sharing it. And like you said, with Facebook, it's like one day it's all great, and the next, what the heck? But yeah, Facebook is... And I mean, this is maybe my opinion, and yeah. I don't want to yeah, yeah. talk negative about anybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think ever since Zuckerberg went on trial, uh-huh. maybe things, you know, went from bad to worse. Yeah. And I even know a lot of people that have gotten rid of their Facebook pages, and they're doing everything on Instagram now. Yeah. Just because Facebook, and too political. Yeah, yeah. I've been hacked. Yeah. I've also been warned about community standards, where I see people posting, like, negativity, uh-huh. Uh, political stuff all like negative and they're fine but yeah. if i put a band or if i do something for example well, yeah i'm the one that's getting the whole community standards well stuff. like our, yeah what, um why i've never really got that yet but I, I started to see things like kind of um pop up where i even like it took me all day to post just do a simple post and then it says there's something is wrong and try back later and then maybe two days later i'm able to make the post um just little weird things and it's not all the time just little things like that pop up and you know our mutual friend Rick Fox, um, he he's a victim of that. I see a lot of times, like um, yes. getting getting threats of being in Facebook jail or whatever. Um, I don't know that he ever has, but like um, for example, when uh, the Cinderella's uh, lead guitarist died recently, Jeff Labar, he posted an old photo of him and Jeff that he had, and he he t- was telling me he got like um, they, they, Facebook like put a warning under a picture that um, they could not confirm that that, that was Jeff Labar or something. And I'm like, oh my god, you can't even post a picture of somebody you know you know that's passed on. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's just uh, it's getting it's getting ridiculous, you know. But um, I can relate to a lot of what you're saying because I got I got um, kind of doing doing what I do with these interviews um, real early on, going back to like 2000 um, 2007. I started off doing like e- just contacting bands and you know like 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 you and and saying hey, I checked out your you know MySpace page or whatever, and um, I, I really dig your guys' music. Hey, oh, I didn't, um, would you like to send a you know. Uh, cd or whatever and i'd be happy to review it and then you know we talk about your music and i was i was amazed at um the willingness of people to just kind of um you know to send out a cd and 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 then the more it started happening i thought you know this is kind of a cool way to kind of um you know check bands out and um and it's just amazing the talent that's out there if you you, like go on some like myspace or or facebook and it's just it's just amazing i i've got some people i've been friends with since myspace myspace of course um it become a virtual kind of um, hole since then. I can't even find my, you know, every everybody went to Facebook, and now Facebook, Facebook has kind of taken over, you know. Yeah. And um, it, it's just, um, it's just amazing though. I, I, um, I, I've, um, I've had pretty good dealings with most of the publicists I've dealt with, but there's this one, um, and again, I'm not going to mention names, but there's this one at Rat Pack Records that. Um, I like a lot of artists on that label, and they changed the publicist. And I don't know what it was. Maybe the publicist thought my site was, you know, didn't get enough hits or something. But he started like every time I request for an interview, um, none of none of the artists were ever available, you know. And um, so so I questioned him on this, and and then he emailed me back, kind of nasty. He was like he didn't like my attitude, and um, and so he he was gonna, he he tells me point, point blank in the email he's going to make sure that I never get a chance to. Um, interview any artist on, on that label, and I thought I was in good with the you know president and the owner of the label. And um, all of a sudden, I stopped getting you know emails from from the label. Um, I, I send emails, nobody's contacting me anymore. So I thought, okay, this this publicist, he's just being a jerk. So of course, I go on with what I do. I don't you know my my business does not depend on that one um, <laughs> label. I'm able to do what I do, and. Um, but I was just recently interviewing Doug Pinnock, the singer from King's X, and he mentions Hi. me. And he mentions to me, "Hey, I, I, hey, I really enjoyed, you know, doing this interview with you, man." He goes, "I have a solo I'm coming out next month on um, Rack, Rat Pack Records. Hit, hit up the publicist there, and um, and let's do another interview." I tell him, "Well, that might be a problem." So, um, so this is about five years since all this stuff with the publicist happened. I had never heard, any, heard heard anything back. And Doug tells me, "Hey, man, I just found out um, what's going on." He says. Um, he says the president of the label told me the reason um, the reason nobody will talk to you at the label is because um, you let some music leak out. Leak out, and I and so um, I'm like, wow, 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 why is this the first time hearing of this? You know, I, I'm like, well, if I'm going to be accused, at least at least make the accusation. But but nobody would get back to me, so I reached out again to the 
to the public, you know, not the publicist, but the guy that's the head of a label. And he said, I mean, and he said, well, whatever's between you and the publicist, that's between you guys, yeah, but we were told that. And, and I'm like, um, so, you know, there's one, there's the one bad kind of um, dealing I've been having with the publicist. And I just thought, that's kind of a shame because for a publicist to take that kind of attitude, you are um, not allowing some, you know, your artist to maybe get an interview at, at certain, certain places just because you don't like the people there, you know? Yes, I, um, I, like, again, everything that I do is positivity, especially now with this pandemic and, yeah. you know, a lot of people losing loved ones and trying to promote, you know, good music, and it's a shame, like yeah. you said, yeah. that people have to be shady at times like these, or you hear about stories about promoters that are stealing the band's money, oh, or, yeah. yeah. Things like this, and I think, oh my gosh! I mean, and it gets people that people be so cruel. And it gets people like you that are good promoters are really in your best interest is having the best, the band's best interest at heart. Sometimes right. it gets people like you a, a bad name. You know what I mean? I mean, like when I find out from Doug Pinnock of all people that that that, that this publicist made up a lie about me that that I that I leaked, um, that, you know, something was emailed to me and I leaked the music purposely, like. Why is this the first I'm hearing of this? Nobody's even accused me of this, and and right. it kind of pissed me off because they're like, I got my reputation. I, you know, I would never do that, and, and 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 you would think if somebody was guilty of something like that, that there'd be more than one person maybe accusing them of that. You know, <laughs> right? And, and so, exactly. I mean, right? I don't do promotions for the money. Yeah, yeah. Especially because people are not making it. I've been watching a lot of documentaries and yeah. during the pandemic, yeah. just trying to get. Um, you know, the loss of my mom, yeah. trying to, you know, do good things. Um, I've been watching documentaries yeah. a lot. And one of them that I had seen was, I um, can't think of the name of it right now, but it was all about the dark times yeah. of the music scene. And I also learned that musicians are not making money like they used to, that the hotels are not accommodating yeah. them anymore like they used to, that whatever they make, that goes for the tours, it goes mm -hmm. to the tour bus, goes to the tour That's manager, why a lot of them the just do the weekend. The venue, yeah. They have to have a lawyer present yeah. Yeah. for everything now, and everything is downloaded. And oh, yeah. I thought, oh my gosh, why am I promoting now? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's awesome music that needs yeah. to be heard. Positivity that needs to be heard. And it's sad. But I try to come along and try to do good for the people like you, mm -hmm. like Greg, like Roy, like this guy, Russ Hewitt. Um... They're just music is just so incredible, and they're also amazing human beings. Oh, I don't yeah. like to look to look at them just as musicians. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. like to look at them as human beings. There's another guy named Kevin Jones. His band is called Stepchild. Okay. And he's uh, phenomenal. Also, um, I'm definitely going to get some interviews for, with you from Roy, Russ Hewitt, Ronnie Robson, Carlos Arroyo from Los Angeles. He's um, in a band called Skulltown. They're a rock band. Oh, okay. He's originally from Bronx, New York. And um, Kevin is from Laguna Beach, California, yeah. and he's got like this raspy, like bluesy, heavy voice. Wow. He's doing um, a show tomorrow in California, um, and it's for a friend of his, the past story that was in a band called, um, I believe Dave DeBest is well known. Uh -huh. So I can definitely share that link if you know people out in Laguna Beach that want to oh, sure. be part of the service. And, and, and feel, There's yeah. no cover. And feel free, Christina, on any of my pages, the, um, post post any of your stuff. Because um, I'm all about, like I said, making connections and being one big kind of happy family. Like, um, Thank you. Like you're saying, you know, well, hey, um, I got this band you want to interview or, you know, I got a friend that's in a band. Wh whatever, you know, that, and then that band, I hope they, um, you know, comment on my page or whatever. And um, it's... it's um, we're all one big happy family. That's kind of my um, exactly. perspective. That's how I look at it. Life is too short. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and like you, um, I have some people that like um, their attitude, which I mean, I, and there's a certain perspective. I guess it's good to be that way. But like, they really want to figure out how they can make the most money. I, and I, I got the attitude that um, you know who doesn't. But uh, I mean, I would love to make money doing this. But but I kind of I also enjoy it as well. So. It, um, so I kind of just do it like you for for fun. I'd love to find a way to make money, but I got a day job like everybody else. I do yeah. I do this I do this in my spare time. I mean I have done a ton of interviews that um for one reason or never just never got posted. But but of the stuff I've posted, for example, I got like 
almost 400 interviews I've posted to date, and that's just to, I, I think that's just my hard work over the years. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example of um, that. Now, it, it's funny, looking back when I first started doing these interviews, like I said, I started out doing them on email. And so for, for the longest time, um, you know, you kind of have that and an and interview because you're, you, um, and, and you, there's a chance, I guess, you don't really know who you're talking to, but um, I was able to tell that I was talking to the real people. And then um, it got to the point where somebody says, you know, why don't you start like calling people on the phone and do an interview? And I'll be, I'll be real honest. I was nervous about doing that at first. And um, it's kind of funny because when I first started doing interviews over the phone, I thought, okay, I'm going to be all prepared and I'm going um, to have all my questions like written out. So I, I'm going to be prepared. But then when I go and listen back to these older interviews, um, you, you kind of can hear like it almost sounds robotic, you know, um, where I, I've developed a style now where, um, you know, I could be talking to Carmine Apiece, I could be talking to a guy in Logo Band, and, and I'm talking to the same in the sense that... Um, it's an attitude where um, I act like I'm talking to an old friend, you know? Um, right. And I try to come up with the, you know, rather than sit there and have, like, my list of prepared questions, I'm just kind of talking off the cuff. That way each interview kind of stands out differently than mm -hmm. sounding the same, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Just like, I mean, um, Greg Fox, he's yeah. on another one. He's yeah. tremendous. His music is so powerful, and I think his music came at a time for me. Yeah. Did I really need it? And I still need it. That song, yeah. Song of Hope, for everyone, just to know that through this pandemic, yeah. you know, support, love, yeah. um, kindness, yeah. being humble, um, knowing that you're not alone. I mean, he and I and Kevin yeah. and Carlos and a lot of my musicians, we all grew up with the church. And that's basically yeah. how we all started. And I, you know, used to be afraid sometimes to talk about it. Yeah. But the, the other day I was talking to my friend Kevin and my friend and Greg. And yeah. even my daughter said to me, Mom, don't ever be afraid to talk about your upbringing with the church. My I, mom never did. And I my mean, mom yeah. had open heart surgery. And she was 84. And the doctors yeah. didn't think she was going to make it. Yeah. She outlived three years. Yeah. Because she was yeah. so positive. Well, I mean, she can yeah. do it. I mean, look at a legendary like guy world. like, um, you know, Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath. Um, right. I mean, he, he's, a, he's a Christian, and he talks about it now. People think, oh, he, oh he's, you know, he's probably a, a, he's probably a devil worshiper. He's in Black Sabbath. But, no, he, right. he's, he's been on the record. And, and even if you look at a band like um, Striper, one of the first things that kind of really yes. really impressed me, you know, you got a raw, you got a raw Christian kind of a... I mean, um, I think they've gone really heavier over the years. Like the newer stuff they're doing is a lot heavier than a lot of the classic stuff they were doing. But yes. you know, people used to kind of laugh. Oh yeah, you go that that that's the band that they, they throw the Bibles out in the audience. But that was their thing. That became their tra trademark. And that right there is kind of like I, that's why I always love the Striper song, like calling to you. That's kind of what it's about. Like you know, God's yes, calling to you. Exactly. Come and join. Come and join our. Um, Follow this band, and and we'll guide, we'll take you with us, you know, on our Christian journey. Um, but look at look at their following, and and and, and that just goes to show you um, they were they were never ashamed to let people know what they were about, you know. Right. So. So there's another metal band too that um, we used to have this thing called Rock the Sound uh -huh. in Bridgeport, and it was organized by different churches for youth group um, kids and adults too yeah. and it was all kinds of musicians and my daughter went and she got to see Skillet oh, she wow. got me hooked on Skillet and they're like striper they're a real heavy metal yeah. but their music is so powerful motivating one song in um, particular that I just love it's called Better Than Drugs oh, and exactly. their music just touches anybody so anybody, if anybody's looking uh -huh. for some good music definitely check out Skillet. Yeah, They're yeah. a little heavier than Striper, but in the same um, genre. Yeah. Their music can just really come at a time when we all need to feel like we're not alone, there's someone there, mm -hmm. um, love, kindness, humility, trying to do the right thing. I mean, I'm not perfect. Yeah. I do things yeah, that yeah. are wrong. Being a teacher, I sometimes have no patience with my little kids, yeah, but yeah. I love. Sometimes, being, like, when I first started this, I used to always hear, oh, it's almost like babysitting, and I would think, here, yeah. right, okay. Yeah. And sometimes I've had to turn some bands away. Yeah. Because I felt like it was almost babysitting, or it was almost like, uh, I don't know. But, yeah. you know, with all the bands I'm working with, I'm blessed. I'm 
happy. I'm in a good place. Yeah. Thank you also for supporting me. Um, there's one more band too. I just thought of right now. They're from Argentina. Sure. It's always been a dream of mine to work with a Hispanic band because they speak Spanish. Oh, okay. And their name is Ironia. And they're metal, but their lead singer sings in English and Spanish. Oh, wow. And yeah. they're incredible. And then now I just got on a new project with this virtuoso guitarist. Oh my gosh, his name is Russ Hewitt. I'm going to send you his link and website too. Wow. And he is just, it's the kind of music you just want to sit outside, put on, have a glass of wine, yeah. wine cooler, even if you don't drink, just calming. Yeah. Just so, he has um, an orchestra from Romania that he just did a new song called Amor Perdido, yeah. long, um, long Lost Love. And the video shows him, but then it shows his orchestra from Romania. Oh, wow. And he is, I want to send you his link. His music is just so touching, so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Send, yeah send me anything you got, Christina, because I, I, I will definitely do that. I love hearing about all this stuff, but you know, um, also getting back to Rick Fox, um, I don't know if you had a chance to ever go on his Wikipedia, like I said, but that's a great source that if you want to find out more about yes. who Rick Fox is. And I was reading something that, you know, I, I never knew until the other day reading reading on there, but, um, you know, after he after the band Sinful, it, you know, he kind of got out of music for a while. And he, he actually for a short while in the, um, in the reserves. And um, then I know even just a couple of years ago when he first came back to L.A., um, he, he he was briefly in this Deep Purple tribute band for about yeah, for about a year. Yeah, they were very good. Yeah, they were great. Yeah, and, oh, so good. And, and what I was saying is, it's great that he kind of had that opportunity, but also to get, kind of get back on stage and play. But I know at that same time when he first came back to LA, he was telling me like, um, and this predates COVID and everything, but they they had this um, like Ultimate Jam Night um, that was this thing they do every week. Um, they kind of pay, pay tribute. Yes. Yeah. Chuck Wright from Quiet Wright, he's the one that started, but he, he got in, uh, Rick, I think, got invited to, down to one of the gigs, and I was kind of encouraged, oh, hey, Rick, you should, you know, you should definitely go and see if you could do more of those gigs, and he was telling me, unfortunately, he goes, I had a good time, except for, he didn't name any names, but he was telling me, you'd be surprised at how um, political, like, a, a weekly gig like that is. He said, there, there are some people, like, from the, from the L.A. Um, area that maybe they were friends with Blackie or other people that he knew from the scene back in the day. And um, for whatever reason, they did everything in their power to kind of, um, yes. you know, make it difficult for Rick Fox to kind of come back for future shows. <clears throat> he did share that story with me. And that story actually has empowered me because I've had so many bullies yeah, yeah. in the state of Connecticut or wherever all of a sudden, now that I'm working with these great and wonderful people, yeah. I've had so many people reaching out to me and try basically telling me to stop. Yeah. Who do you think you are? All this political nonsense and drama. Yeah. So, in a way, I can relate to Rick, but you just got to keep on going. But yeah, I know yeah. for him, it's so hard. And I feel, when he was telling me the story, I felt so bad because I thought, oh my gosh, you're just trying to get out there. You, But there's always those bullies, yeah, always yeah. those cliques that can never be happy with themselves they're so insecure yeah. they want to fit in they want to do what's right what other people are telling them and in the end someone always gets hurt yeah and rick got hurt and i can't blame him because yeah. i would feel the same way too yeah but rick has always taught me well to like, like i even i even try to don't tell him up, don't give up like i even try to tell him you know rick you should then um uh, you know he was really discouraged from that and, and i was trying to encourage him like rick you should really do some, put together a band or something of your own but i think you've got enough of a following like, um, I don't know if he's able to or whatever, why he doesn't, but, like, he's released some of his Sin material, like, online, and I always kind of thought that, um, yeah, hey, why don't you put a CD of that out? You know, I, I, the people that kind of follow you, I think they would at least, you know, want to check it out, or some people would buy it, or I, I don't know. That's just kind of um, my opinion, and I don't know if you know about this, Christina, but um, I recently came across an old demo that, r that features Rick Fox. It's called We Got Your Rock, and I know that um, Ace Frehley... Uh, there's a version of the, the song Ace Fraley does on his um, 1987 uh, Fraley's Comedy album. Do you know anything about that? <laughs> yes. In fact, tomorrow, uh -huh. Alice Cooper, one of my favorites. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. He's coming. To, we have a new amphitheater. I'm going to send you the link to, to that, too. Uh -huh. Any band that, you know, wants to come to Connecticut next year, it's a beautiful theater. Wow. And Ace Fraley is opening up with Fraley's Comet. Oh, wow. So he's going to do a mix of Rock Soldiers, my poor daughter. Uh -huh. She's been hearing that song this whole week. And then Alice Cooper 
is going to be on um, right afterward. I don't know. I think they call it the Legends Tour or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's Alice and Ace. And, 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 oh, um, my gosh. Alice Cooper 72 years old. And I look at him like, well, listen, he had all kinds of negativity yeah. pushed to his way. If he's still doing it, well, then why can't I do it? Yeah, yeah. So and, I look up to him. Like, you know, wow, Alice is one of my Alice is one of my all time favorite rockers, and I I, I dare say he just, his his new music just gets better. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to hear a new album that came out this year, Detroit Stories. It's one of yes. the one of the best things he's done in years, and you know it went to number one like in four countries, including the U.S. So I mean, for a guy, first of all, that's been in the business over fifty years, I mean, mm -hmm. he's putting out great music, um, and and I got to tell you. Um, I just did a show, I don't know if you had a chance to check it out, with this other guy, uh, Gar, Gar Boris. I, I do these shows, what they're called, Gar Boris's Time Machine, and we talk about different aspects of, um, you know, pop culture. Sometimes we talk about, t you know, classic TV shows, classic movies, classic albums, and, and we recently, um, our latest episode is on the 50th anniversary of Alice Cooper's Love It to Death album. And um, that's... A, I'll that's, have to check it out. That sounds an, really cool. That's another classic album, and... Um, and what's kind of interesting about, um, if you know anything about Alice Cooper, that was kind of the first album he did with Bob Ezrin. It was kind of his, uh, the band's breakout album, because if you, I dare you to go on like um, YouTube and check out like he, um, the first two Alice Cooper albums, like the second one I think is called Pretties For You. Sounds nothing like Alice Cooper band that you know and love. I mean, it almost sounds like psychedelic um, music, but, if, but by the time they did the Love It To Death album, um, with I'm 18, like Caught in a Dream. I mean, that's the album where, where Alice really found his sound. Yeah, and so I'll send you a link later to that show so you can um, check it out. It's a pretty, pretty cool show. Um, He's amazing. I know Greg Fox, uh -huh. um, he was filling in for Asia. I don't know how long ago. I can't remember how long yeah, ago yeah. it was, but he got to tour with Alice Cooper. Wow. And I was sharing, you know, some really cool stories about how Alice, before, you know, they go on, they all, I guess they're in their dressing room or <laughs> someone's room or whatever, they all start with a prayer and then they do like a doxology or something. And yeah. he just hasn't changed. He's still the same guy that, I mean, when I first saw him, I used yeah. to be afraid of him. Oh, yeah, yeah. And now I look at him like, he could, he's just a regular guy. He's playing golf. Yeah. I mean... I'd like to see I him mean, he wrote, in he, he wrote golf a golf tournament. He wrote a book just about playing golf and how it kind of helped yes, him. Yes, I read it. It's a biography. And it's a 12 steps of playing golf. Yeah. Anyone get that book. Yeah. Talks about his life and the front cover of him with like all his makeup on. Yeah. And the back cover, it's black and white in the back. And he's holding a golf club. It's really funny. It's such a good book. So please, anyone, get that book. Yeah, and, and now, just, I, yeah, I'll tell you, um, another thing to check out if you're an Alice Cooper fan, I mean, this goes back um, to 1975, but they recently released a couple of years back this DVD called um, Alice Cooper's Nightmare. It's uh, like a TV special they had from um, back in the day in 1975, and it was like basically the Welcome to My Nightmare album come to life. It's like a concert of that, and um, wow! And it's just like nothing you've ever seen, but um, it, it's amazing. <laughs> I, pretty much anything Alice does, I'm a fan of. <laughs> He's just incredible, and again, for being 73 years old, I mean, yeah. And they, the musicians that I'm working with, they're all like, Christina, we're older than you are. How old are I you? Mean, like 48. I, yeah, oh, I, we're older than you. Yeah. Are you? Are you, are you do you enjoy it? I'm like, I enjoy working yeah. with the oldies, yeah. and they're all laughing. Yeah. They're like, what? Yeah. I mean, I dare say. Alice Cooper has nothing on the Rolling Stones, you know? Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that's all of that music. I think when um, the drummer passed away recently, yeah, too, yeah. that, I mean, there are a lot of, there have been a lot of passings and deaths and yeah, stuff, yeah. but that one, to me, I guess stood out because here he was, it's just like average British guy. Yeah, yeah. And I, mean, I was reading, he was what a, they became. Yeah. yeah. In, in fact, I did a thing uh, with one of my friends recently, um, where we did a show called Remembering um, Charlie Watts. Um, it was just a few weeks after he passed, and um, it's kind of amazing to find out, like you are saying, he's a one member of a band. Like we said he's the quietest member of a band, for example, when they got inducted into Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, he, didn't, he didn't show up for an event like the other guys, just for his, not that he didn't appreciate it or nothing, but he was kind of, he's kind of like the shy guy of a band, and he, he didn't really like you know, a lot of hoopla um, like the other guys in the band, and he was just kind of a quiet guy, <laughs> but he, he lived right. to be 80, and... Um, He's kind of, I guess, the guy that, the one guy of the band, probably people know the least about. <laughs> exactly. 
Exactly. I mean, when I, um, I just like to make people laugh yeah. because that's just my human nature. When I heard Renaissance Rock, rock uh-huh. Orchestra's music, just like all these other yeah. bands, I thought, oh, I'd like to be a part of that. And I was never so blunt. I was always afraid yeah. to ask, to always be afraid to ask. And one day, I guess I just reached out to this guy and I said, listen, your music's yeah. fantastic. Do you guys have a promoter? Six months later, here I am promoting them. I got them a distribution record label called Curtain Call Records. Wow, wow. I admit, I like guys with long hair because I was a part of that scene. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. born in 73. I mean, even if you don't have long hair, I don't care. I don't judge anyone. Yeah, yeah. But when I met Roy and I saw this blonde hair, I thought, oh, my gosh. Even Greg. I mean, Kevin, too. Carlos. All of them. I'm just like... Well, Greg Fox, wow. I got to tell you, super cool guy. I've never met him in person. I, yes. I just talked to him I on mean, the... He, yes. He's funny. They yeah. all have the sense of humor. Yeah about them like Lonnie Hammer they're just funny regular normal guys yeah, great, and they just yeah. want to be treated like people they don't want yeah. to be treated like musicians oh, yeah. there's they're all sports fans like I am too, so, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if, I don't get a chance to go on Greg Fox's, like, official page, but, like, I, just reading his bio is very interesting to see all the yes. different players he's yes, played I with. Right. And um, all the musicians he's worked with. And then when and, I yep. read that he's been playing the piano since age five, I'm like, wow, that's why that guy plays like that, you know? And um, I think one thing, you know, I accidentally kind of came across... Um, the Renaissance Rock Orchestra page, you know, on Facebook and just kind of discovered it by accident. And I thought, you know, I'm listening to some of the stuff and I'm like, you know, this takes me back to like those, uh, you know, that big rock sound like of the 70s and 80s. It reminds me of like stuff like Journey and Queen, you know, and I told him that when I interviewed him and, um, yeah, and then, and then, yeah, and then you, you, you listen to some of their original music and, um, I went online and they got, he's got a great uh, YouTube channel if anybody wants to check it out about what, what this Renaissance Rock Orchestra is all about. And it impressed the hell out of me, just the, just the original music. And I, I was listening to this song. It's on one of the older albums called To Be With You. And I'm listening Beautiful to it. Beautiful song, And I'm yes. listening to it, and I'm like, not even, before I even interviewed Greg about it, um, I finally got a chance to talk to him about it. I said, you know, I mean, your songwriting, man, is just really impressive. It's, it's, I listened to that, and it really sounds like it came out of a page of somebody's life. And he says, well, let me tell you what that song's about. He says, it's about a girlfriend of mine that I was very close to, and unfortunately, she died of <coughs> cancer. And it's basically, you know, how that affected me. And I'm like, wow, man, I, I could feel your, I could feel your pain. But but it's a beautiful song, and it, it's basically his memory of you know, his girlfriend that he lost. I mean, just yep. amazing. <laughs> yep, his that song. My dad had cancer, uh, so I can relate. And my mom had congestive heart failure and COPD. Yeah, and so. Their music just, I don't know. It's like wow. nothing I've heard before. I mean, it's its its like, like I said, it, it has a big kind of rock sound from the 70s, 80s, those bands we were just mentioning. But um, it's also got a great original thing. It doesn't really, he's got his own sound going amazingly enough. And um, I mean, you compare the, that song to Be With You, for example, to another song that's on the current EP, um, um, what's it, Circus Life. Um, <laughs> and that to me has kind of got like... Um, Kind of a psychotic, kind of Joker, evil clown, kind of carnival sound. Real to life. It's a real to life. All their music is real to life, and how we can all yeah what's going on today, and how we can all relate to it today. Whether it's yeah. a good thing or not a good thing, that this is life. This is how it really is out there, and we need yeah. to hear more music like that. Not just the good stuff, but yeah. to know that there are crazy things out there. It's just depending on how you handle it. Yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, and in fact, you know, like um, another song I love off the new um, EP they got. The title track, Song of Hope, and I was telling Greg, that's I a, cry when I hear that song. I said, that's a great I song to me. To. It really fits with what everybody's dealing with right now with COVID and all the lockdowns. I was saying, you know, um, that's what really people need right now. They, they need some, they need kind of have to have some hope. And that's a great inspiration, I think, um, people could relate, relate to with um, thinking about what everybody's dealing with right now in the world. I've um, experienced some um, deaths, some close yeah. friends of mine from high school all over from yeah. suicides and as soon as someone will tell me about yeah. a death I'm like well put that song Song of Hope on find yeah. it on YouTube or something and Love and Arms play it. Yeah. Love and Arms and, that's another one I, oh and my Love and Arms too actually a girlfriend of mine is getting married 
um, in a couple of months, and she was looking for a wedding song. Wow. And I know this is live, but yeah. I feel like right now that that's going to be her wedding song. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Wow. I hope he doesn't hear it now, but I have to let him know that I listen. I kind of mentioned it in an interview, but uh -huh. she texted me today. She's like, I found my wedding song in my love and arms. Like, oh my gosh, Greg is going to be thrilled. How, how cool um, is that? I mean, um, and, and see, the cool thing about that is... Um, you know that that's off. You know, that's like off the newest release. I mean, um, a lot of times when p people pick um, a wedding song, it's something that's like, you know, it, it might be like uh, Beth by Kiss or, or you know, um, some some other classic rock song that we all know, or you know, Somebody to Love um, by Queen. Right. And um, love. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, so I do yeah. the fact that um, you know she's picking a song by a, a band that's just been around a couple of years. That's pretty cool. The music I love it that he's a keyboardist too because oh yeah you know he was sharing some stories about how some venues mm -hmm. um, he never mentioned any and I never asked yeah, him yeah. because I understand the privacy yeah yeah but so many venues even here in Connecticut the music scene in general keyboardists are so shunned down yeah Billy Idol had one oh Cinderella, yeah Rush yeah. I mean I was watching a documentary about Iron Maiden and Bruce Dickinson in the beginning said no 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 yeah. synthesizers well let, let me tell you um, it's funny you mentioned like Cinderella and I know Ki Ki uh, Kiss and Cinderella they, they use the same um, um, keyboard for, for quite a number of years his name was Gary right. he, the, he, same guy, the same he, day that Jeff LeBar passed away their keyboardist passed away yeah. the same day too yeah and, and here's the interesting thing about uh, Gary Corbett we're talking about and um the other keyboard player I know that Kiss had off stage um, was Derek Shrinian. Um, he's been well known in uh, the rock community for a number of um, years as a keyboardist. But like, e even a known guy like that, they had off stage. And so um, that that's one of the things that really kind of uh, made me take notice of Renaissance Rock Orchestra because it's really um, based around the piano player and the keyboard. And um, I've always had people tell me, "Oh, keyboards don't belong in rock music. They suck." But then I tell people. You go and you listen to any of those classic, um, like Deep Purple albums, what John Lord did and with the Hammond organ, and you tell me keyboards don't belong in rock music, or, or look at some of like um, that debut Mark album. Zeppelin. I mean, John Paul, jo John Paul Jones. Yeah, that debut he album by keyboards. Boston. You know, um, you know, um, <clears throat> give me a, uh, um, you know, that debut Boston album. I mean, um, great stuff, great stuff. Um, and I, I think keyboards give it like an extra uh, layer. That's why I love what Greg's doing with uh, this band because he's got a cast yes. of revolving door uh, musicians. But I think that keeps it fresh, not just for him, but people, you know, go to see the band play live. You kind of don't know who's going to be playing live that night, but I think it makes it that much more fun to go see a band like that. Definitely, me from Michael T. Ross. Yeah, yeah. He's a keyboardist for Lita Ford. And oh yeah. He's working on some other things. He's another one that's so incredible. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, keyboardists just like bass players. Yeah. They need to be well known out there too. I mean, nothing against front men and guitar yeah. players yeah, or yeah. drummers, but oh my gosh, they fit in. They're a part of the missing puzzle yeah. too. Let's give them for Rush. I mean, yeah. my goodness. Yeah, Great another yeah. band. Another guy that um that I've interviewed like twice now. I'm going to reach out to him again because he's also involved with um, Renaissance Rock Orchestra is Brian Tishy, the drummer. And um, right. what's amazing about Brian, he, he's a great guy to talk to. He's got a ton of experience, but um, more, more than that, he's just a super nice guy. But I don't know if you realize that while he's known primarily as a drummer, Christina, he's also, um, he can play other instruments. Like he, he can sing lead. He can, he can um, play the guitar. In fact, he also, besides putting on that, Tribute every year to John Bonham, the Bonzo Bash. Right. That's his thing. Mm -hmm. He also he, he's the one that launched Randy Rhodes Remembered, and he gets all these great guitar players. And I think he got up on stage a few times with the guitar and did his thing. So I, I love guys like that that can you know they're known maybe for in his case like being the drummer, but um, he, he can also do other things. <laughs> Hey, no, just like a guitar player can play keyboards, or uh -huh. there was a band from Canada that never really got enough credit called Helix. Oh, yeah. And I, I'm such a huge fan of theirs because one of their players does guitar and plays keyboards, and I'm like, how come we never heard about this? I mean, they, they Why were... Why is everything yeah. so hush-hush? They were big, and they were much bigger in Canada. I mean, in the right. early, early early 80s, they, they had a little bit of a splash here in America, but... Um, they never had that big break. Like, I mean, I remember seeing stuff like um, they had videos for so songs that were kind of hits here, like uh, Heavy Metal Love or um, Good to the Last Drop. Rock You. Yeah. 
Um, and, and he continues to put out new stuff, but um, he's, you know, uh, Brian Ballmer, he's the main guy, and he's, he's got different members in and out of the band, but um, he continues to put stuff out. So um, there's another legend, it was kind of a legendary Canadian band um, known as Moxie. I had never heard anything about this band, and then this publicist, it told me, hey, I, I got this band Moxie, I'm and I kind of find out their story. Their original lead singer died in a horrible um, motorcycle accident, and again, they never made, had a big splash here in the United States, but in Canada, they were huge stars. And um, it's one of those bands that you think they should, somebody should make a movie about this band. It's just kind of tragic. And then the reason I was interviewing the band, they, they just decided to reform, and they got, um, of all people, to uh, replace the singer Russ Dwarf from the Killer Doors. <clears throat> or no, no, Nick Walsh. Nick Walsh. That's what it was. Um, but he was another kind of well-known um, Canadian singer. But um, one of those bands that, like, in Canada, they just had, even, like, Triumph, I hear they're coming out with a documentary. Yes, Triumph, yeah. Um, they, in the 80s, like, they were right there with Rush, but for whatever reason, Rush got a Rush got a bigger push. I mean, and if you go back and you listen to some of that classic uh, Triumph stuff from the 70s, great music, but a lot of people forgot about them. <clears throat> There's even a band called, um, and I've always liked the underrated music scene, uh. a band called Bonham. Jason Bonham and the lead singer yeah. passed away in his thirties of like a heart attack or yeah. a stroke. Daniel yeah. McMaster. Oh wow! People yeah. People need to hear Bonham. They have one of the brothers or one of their friends plays mm -hmm. violin. Another one plays keyboards. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing band, and I believe the name of the album is called Disregard of Time. That's the debut Day. album, and that's probably the album that had the um, biggest Wait push. Wait for you, guilty. Yeah. To watch their videos and to see an electronic violinist, yeah. a keyboardist, I'm thinking, yeah. why don't we hear about them? And what's amazing what's is, yeah, what's amazing is Bonham got a little bit of push on that first album, obviously because it's the son of Led Zeppelin's, uh, you know, uh, famous drummer John Bonham. But um, it, right. it didn't really sound nothing like Led Zeppelin, which I think was a cool thing because he was trying to do his own thing. But you, uh, right. um, I'm sure you know what Jason's doing these days instead of kind of doing his own band. He's, he's Sammy Hager's drummer. Yes, I got to see them six years ago with my daughter. Mm -hmm. My fiance went to our casino and it was uh, so many in the yeah. circle yeah. with um, Michael Anthony, Sammy Hager, Jason Bonham. And Vic Johnson. And, um, the guitar player. I've, the guitar player. Oh, Vic Johnson. His name. His, his name is Vic Johnson. Yes. yes. Oh my gosh. It was amazing. Now, it I'll was tell you. So, yeah. um, if you're, if you're at all a fan of those guys, they put out a, a CD earlier this year of like, it's called the Lockdown Sessions. It is like a lot of cool covers they did. Um, they cover Van Halen, some of the stuff Sammy did. They cover like um, a Little Richard tune. They cover a Who tune. Um, like if you go on YouTube and just type in like um, Sammy Hager and the Circle, I'm sure, or the Lockdown Sessions, it'll come up. I have to check. Is it a CD that I can buy? Well, you can buy a CD. I, I got mine like on Amazon. You could probably still get it there but um i like, want to check that out but it's pretty, i mean if you want to check some just, video of it out yeah. first yeah i'll see if i can send you a link later but yeah it's pretty it's pretty cool and what they it was um all recorded like during um during the lockdown where nobody could like be in the same room and they would kind of videotape these uh different songs and make mi videos for them and uh, i guess they would kind of challenge each other like uh, jason bottom was the one that started it like um i bet you couldn't play this song and um and they they, they just uh, break out into these cover tunes and but it's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> That's amazing. Even I got to see, um, we have a little venue here in Connecticut called River Rock Tavern. Mm -hmm. And I got to meet John Karabi. I got to meet Mike Tramp. Mm -hmm. One thing everyone needs to know, if you see Mike Tramp, talk to him about the Home Depot. Mm -hmm. It's like he's your best friend. He loves the Home Depot. Wow. Then Lizzie, yeah. talk to him. I... Um, was watching a documentary about them. I'm mm -hmm. a huge Mike Triumph fan. Mm -hmm. um, I liked White Line, but I like him also. So, and Jailbreak was actually the song that he used to use for soundcheck. Oh, wow. And he was telling me a funny story in the group of people, probably like five years ago, uh -huh. that he loved Ryan James Dio. Oh, who did? But he was doing a tour with him. Uh -huh. And I guess he was a prankster. Uh -huh. So when Ronnie was about ready to see him do the soundcheck, he unplugged part of the mic. <laughs> and Ronnie's doing the soundtrack, and he's wondering, what the heck is it? Why is it not working? Yeah. And Mike is just standing there laughing. <laughs> Ronnie's like, what's going on? What's going on? He's like, dude, I, I just unplugged it. 
<laughs> you know, I love your voice, but I just, I, I unplugged it. I, yeah. We were all laughing so much because they just want to be treated. We got to meet Billy Sheehan. We yeah. were all eating pizza outside, toad spice with Billy Sheehan. Wow. Um, Billy Sheehan was talking about his wine and how he's such a huge wine, you know. Guy, um, yeah. Loves wine, and I guess he was in the works of making some custom guitars or someone he knows, you know, out of like uh, uh, something to do with some red wine or rosé wine or something to do like that with his uh, bass guitars. Wow. Having something to do with, with wine. Yeah. So it just, you know, like John Carabi is a huge pasta fazul, pasta fan. I mean, he's Italian, wow. but when I met him, we were talking about Italian food and... Yeah. Who would know? Yeah, I, I've I, never, I've never met John in person, but I had the pleasure of speaking to him on the phone twice, interviewing him. Nice and guy, super Great. nice. He's another comedian. And, and, yeah, He's yeah, comedian. And, and, and super talented guy. I mean, I'll tell you, um, I never, uh, um, I never knew who John Karabi was before that Motley Crue album. You know what I mean? I mean, um, that nice. was my introduction to him, like a lot of people. And ever since I heard him on that album, I've been a fan of everything he's. He did before, and since I, I gave you a perfect example, like some people tell me, oh, you never heard of a Scream? I mean, that Scream album came out, I guess, right before he joined Motley Crue, so um, I somehow missed that when it was originally released, but I, ever since I heard that, I, I loved that. I loved the band he had with Bruce Kulick, Union, um, and then I became a Dead Daisies fan because of him, because he was right. in the band, and um, it's interesting that he's no longer in the band, but um, that, that's another one of those bands. Um, they got an interesting story, but... The Dead Daisies are really um, kind of centered around David Lowry, the the um, blonde guitar player. Um, he's kind of the main uh, mainstay in the band. They have like kind of like a revolving cast of characters. Doug Aldridge has been in the band for a while, but um, like even well, you can you can't really go wrong, you know, with Glenn Hughes. Um, but I thought, who the hell is going to replace Karabi in the Dead Daisies? But of course, Glenn Hughes sounds nothing like John Karabi, but somehow they've made it work. People accept right. it, and, and and I kind of love that about the Dead Daisies that um, they're able to kind of the fans love whatever they do, no matter who's in the band. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. I want to see. I've been trying now that things are starting yeah. to open up in Connecticut. Last night, I went to see um, a band called Flannel Clan Masses, and then there was another band called Round Three, and oh. another band called The Riot Kings. I oh. love those guys in Connecticut. Shout out to them. Um, one of the guys in one of these bands was telling me, oh, Dan, from the Flannel Clad Mass, mm. something about one of his first bands, I guess they opened up for Spinal Tap. Wow, yeah. And he's fairly. I'm like, what? Yeah. He's like, oh, the stories of Ace Christina, I can't remember what they were. It was just cracking me up. And in round three, the guitar player, Tom Nostin, yeah. is Matt Starr's cousin. Yeah. Matt Starr worked at one of the school systems here in Connecticut before yeah. he went out to L.A., and the Riot Kings, their guitar player, Bill Barclay, and I believe their bass player, Keith, mm -hmm. um, they started out in the L.A. scene with their drummer, Mark Misagna, mm -hmm. and they were trying really hard to make it, and they were so close to making it with another name. Wow. Mark was in another band with this guy named Carlo Papula and um, someone else, and they were out in the L.A. scene, and they almost made it, but unfortunately, they didn't get their break. Yeah. But to hear stories about these awesome local bands that have been there for me since I lost my mom, incredible, loving people, yeah. to hear these stories and just like, wow, that is so cool. But just treat them like regular people. Just, that's the main thing Dan said. If you meet Al, um, Ace, don't talk about Kiss. Yeah. Ask him. Um, so when, you know, um, you're Irish, right? Yeah. Um, do you know how to make uh, Irish stutter bread or you know, something like that? Just to kind of make them feel that, because after a while they asked so many times about yeah. music. But, uh, you know, like all these different things that they love to talk about outside of music. John Karabi, though, let me tell you, you will laugh your butt off with him. He's a comedian. <laughs> yeah. He's John, John, you know, um, I, I got to say, too, I, I'm a huge fan, like I said, of, of, of everything John's ever done. But um, sometimes, you know, like you, you read stuff about some of your fam famous um, rockers that you grew up on, stuff they have to say. Like I, I read a couple years back an interview Nikki Six did where he was kind of... Um, I mean, you remember when John Karabi was in the band, Nikki Six, he couldn't do nothing but um, praise John, of course, what a great vocalist, what a great songwriter, how much better Motley Crue was without Vince Neil. And then a couple of years back, he's like um, talking about, oh man, 
that album we did with Krabi, man, it was re it was really a struggle. I had to teach the guy how to write a song. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, I mean, if, if you go back and you listen like to that Scream album, like I said, that's that's all John Karabi pretty. I mean, it's got the other guys in the band, but I mean, um, he wrote all that stuff before he was ever in Motley Crue. So to say the guy doesn't know how to write a song, I, I don't know, Nikki. you know? I know. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I know. And then I was recently, um, people have kind of been, there's a this rumor that um, Nikki wants to uh, kick Vince Neil out of Motley Crue and get John back. And John, I, I got to give John his props because John was saying, you know, um, I, I've been in no negotiations. I would never go back to, and I really can't blame him for that. I mean, I got to say the guy's got his, because he was saying, you know, Nikki said some things about me in an interview. And um, so why would I go back now? Which, again, I, I, I mean, some people might kind of go back because, okay, I can make a, a big, um, I could make some bank, you know, but um, I, I, I respect that he's got that pride, you know. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you want to be the bigger and better person, yeah. which I've learned, but it's okay. Yeah. Like myself, like everybody else out there to say no. Yeah, it's yeah. It's okay to say no. Yeah. As a promoter, if I didn't say no, I'd be bombarded, bombarded, bombarded with all these bands, and it's almost like at times I have to take a break from Facebook. Oh, yeah, I, I just mean, have to shut it down yeah. at night, especially because now I've been really working with her with a lot of these other bands yeah. that I've had to just say, okay, when my daughter's home, I try yeah. to make, and I have, and I've had to put priorities and check yeah. for myself. When yeah. my daughter's here with me, I do not do any promos. I do not do anything. I did something this morning. It was yeah. a band that sent me something to listen to, and I told her, and then after that, I shut it off. Yeah, I'm, I said to yeah. her, I my daughter is my daughter she's yeah. the love of my life yeah. since we lost my mom I'm her mother even though she's 27 yeah. I want her to know that I'm this always is my here. time with her yeah I'm, I, I'm luckily at a point in life where like I said I, I, um, I do this, these interviews and stuff for fun I enjoy it um, I, I always you know kind of enjoy music's been a big part of my life for, for many years and I kind of dig like getting a chance to talk to some of these people and um, it's kind of funny, like, the other day interviewing a guy like, a legendary guy like Carmine of Peace, I mean, there's part of me, like, as I'm doing, I'm thinking, wow, I'm talking to Carmine of Peace, but you got to kind of um, check yourself, you know, and just kind of act like you're talking to a normal guy. And like I said, right. by the end of the interview, I'm like, man, this, you know, this guy's got no, um, he's got no, he's got to have some, somewhat of an ego, but he's, he's totally cool. Like, he's, um, you know, he, he, he's not feeling his rock star uh, thing today, you know? <laughs> Exactly. Oh my gosh, I just thought of it right now. I have to give two more shout outs. A rock band from uh, Los Angeles called Skull Tone. They're a hard rock band. They're really cool. Yeah. Carlos Arroyo's band. Carlos is also in a band in a Los Angeles um, tribute to, Stone, to Jimi Hendrix called Stone Free. Oh, wow. And he's got another one. And Carlos, I apologize if I say it wrong. It's Carlos Arroyo and the Blues Rock groove something like that oh, wow. they're going to be working on some new music soon and then there's a band from virginia called as the world burns and they just came out with a new cd it's on yeah. spotify called prevail wow. it's all about what's going on with the pandemic see this is what i and, yeah this is what i dig about talking to uh, somebody like you christina because that's like you and these bands you're mentioning from la I, I, i'm just just uh just the sound of a name like man that's a cool sounding name how's it that i've not heard about these bands but like like you're saying there's, uh, even if you just um, if Facebook was your only source, there's so many there's so many bands out there that um, we just don't know about. I mean, I posted on one of my right. pages today. Um, this this girl, I mean, she she did a beautiful cover of Skid Row's. Um, I, I forget her name right now, but but it, it's on my page, and uh, and I'll send you a link so you. Can, but it's um, beautiful cover of Skid Row's "I Remember You," and I'm like. Um, wow. Just um, yeah, she's covering somebody else's material, but I mean, she's she's got the voice. And there's so many people out there that, that you know never that we don't even know about. And that's what I ask a lot of these people when I interview. You know, like hey, it's you know it's pretty amazing that um, you know there's people halfway around the world you know um, listening to your album right now that just came out, and and you've never stepped foot in that country. That's got to be you know kind of a cool feeling for you. And they're like, yeah, man, it is. Definitely, I try to vary myself out with working with all kinds of bands, and I've always loved guitar virtuosos, but this guy, Russ Hewitt, yeah. his music is just so, and even like this Argentinian metal band, mm -hmm. they came at a time for me where yeah. I thought, great, now I can brush yeah. up on my Spanish. Well, you know, yeah. And when they put something out there, I can actually translate it. Then there's a guy from Chile who lives out in Finland. No, we're not related, which we were. Yeah. It was Eric Avila. 
and he's like the older, younger version of Santana. Oh. He makes that guitar sing. I'm going to send you his link. I too. was wondering about that. I'm glad you kind of cleared that up because I seen Eric Avila and I thought, oh, maybe that's a. Maybe that's your husband, okay. or that's somebody she's... We were joking around yeah. one day, and I said to America, are really related? Well, I'm from Chile. Where are you from? Yeah. My father's from Cuba. No, we're not cousins. And yeah. I thought, darn it, I want to do an ancestry thing now. Yeah. And because it, if we're yeah. related, yeah. it would be funny. so cool. Yeah. He's like the young Santana. Wow. He makes that guitar sing. Yeah, and, and, and he's in Finland, wow. and he's doing some recordings, and I have to send you his stuff, too. He's yeah. just another one. I love, so. I love Shredder-type stuff, but I, I tell you... Um, a thing with that type of uh, guitar playing, I mean, you got, I mean, they're, they're guitar players, obviously, like Steve Vai, Satriani, that really stand out because as while they can shred with the best of them, there, there's there's some musicality to what they do, you know? It does not, like, if you listen to one of their albums, it's not 10, ten uh, tunes that sound like the same thing or sa a bunch of angry bees, you know? Uh, there's, I mean, I'll never forget, like, st to speak about Steve Vai, very first time I ever heard him was on David Lee Ross. um, debut solo album, Eat em and Smile, when I heard, seen that video for um, Yankee Rose, the way he made his guitar talk, I mean, it spoke to me. Um, that, that's some, be like some beautiful <laughs> music there. And um, obviously, Christine, I could talk to you all day, but um, I won't take up any more of your time, but if you could hold that's on. Okay. If you could hold on for just a minute, I'd like to talk yeah. to you.